My big question for you is, will animals that have brain organoids from humans put into their brains ever develop human-like consciousness, human-like thinking? I'm Insu Hyun, a philosopher and bioethicist. I asked my friend and world-renowned neuroscientist Sergio Pashka to join me for a conversation about his groundbreaking research on human brain organoids, which he uses to unravel the mysteries of mental illness. Sergio Pashka, that's a Romanian name. It is. You're from Transylvania in Romania. I am, yeah. There's so much misinformation around that. I mean, it's a beautiful part of the world, historically extremely important, and everybody just leaps to all kinds of conclusions about Dracula and mythology. So I want to talk about mythology. I want to take talk about misconceptions. Um, Maybe to unpack some of that, tell me, why is your work important for psychiatry? Well, psychiatric disorders pose a huge burden to society. I mean, one in five individuals or so suffer from a neuropsychiatric disease worldwide. Mm, Um, And in fact, psychiatric conditions are the uh, biggest, you know, source of disability worldwide. First of all, because they're, you know, they're chronic conditions and Mm -hmm. also because they're like very prevalent. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that, you know, we're still diagnosing most psychiatric disorders behaviorally by just watching the behavior of, uh, you know, of these patients in, of course, mm-hmm. in a clinical setting or uh, in, in their social environment. And the issue with that is that, you know, we still don't have much of a sense of the biology of these conditions. And mm-hmm. in the last 10 years or so, we've seen, you know, huge advances in understanding the genetics of this condition. So we now have a long list of genes that are associated with psychiatric disorders. And you see this in the news all the time, you know, scientists identify gene X Mm -hmm. associated with autism or with schizophrenia and so on. But, you know, you end up with this kind of disconnect where on one hand, we've been cataloging behavior Mm -hmm. of these conditions, the clinical phenotype of these conditions for centuries now. And on the other hand, we finally have some of the genes that are presumably causing these conditions. Mm -hmm. But in between, um, there, there are still a lot of unknowns. We don't understand what cell types do those genes affect mm-hmm. and in what circuits do those cells sit. And so what are the causes for those behavioral changes? And the, you know, what we've learned from other branches of medicine, in particular from oncology, is that therapeutic advances mm-hmm. come when you leverage the power of molecular biology, when you actually put it at work in mm-hmm. cells um, of interest. And so that became essentially one of my main goals as I was like finishing medical school. So this is the mental health exhibit. And it's all about psychiatry and the brain. Yeah. So we can kind of talk a little bit about psychiatry here. So Sergio, I brought you to our mental health exhibit at the museum just because I think there's a really interesting connection between the history of psychiatry and the work you do. We're actually, in fact, in the middle of a mock-up of a psychiatrist's office as part of the exhibit. So hopefully your approach in the future could help inform what goes on in a place like this. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we still today talk about like schizophrenias or like autism spectrum disorders, which are large groups of conditions that are behaviorally defined, have some common behavioral characteristics, Mm -hmm. but we do know that they're like very heterogeneous. So the question is, will we in the future have, you know, 10 forms of autism or 20 or 30? Will they be based on, for instance, on whether they affect like immune cells of the brain or whether they affect glial cells or neurons? Will we have different types of treatments for this condition? So um, just describing the biology of this condition systematically, and that will take years, uh, it will be strictly necessary towards developing uh, treatments that are rationally designed. I want to talk about your latest work because there's such an amazing progression in the story you're telling about how we're studying the brain using uh, organoids. So as I understand it, an organoid is a three-dimensional model of an organ of interest. So it could be like heart organoid, it can be gut organoid, in your case, cerebral cortex or brain organoid. These are three-dimensional models that are made from human stem cells that kind of go through the very early stages of development of that organ and to tell us a little bit of something of how those organs might work. Is that correct? Right. Yes, it, it is correct. And one other feature is that they're recapitulating aspects of that organ function. Like, mm-hmm. obviously not all the organs function, not necessarily all the features, but some aspects of yeah. it. 
Yeah, and they're really small. They're, they're not very tiny. They're, and you sh except for maybe the gut organized that I've seen, they don't even look they're like the organ in question, right? They're miniaturized versions. Yeah, yeah, and and I think the brain organized they're white because they're they don't have like vasculature. They're, right. They're, they're kind of pale. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're not well, pink and squishy. <laughs> most of them are kind of like whitish. And then an assembly is something that you've done. That's where you take organoids and you put them together and you assemble them together to make something a little bit more complicated. Is that right? Yeah, uh, an assembly can be formed by either putting at least two organoids together mm -hmm. uh, or putting an organoid and combining it with cell types that are perhaps not present in that organoid. Mm -hmm. So generally organoids don't have immune cells, mm -hmm. but if you want to model neuroimmune interactions, mm -hmm. you can take immune cells from the same patients and then insert them inside the organoids. And just in general, assembloid would assume that there are some interactions between uh, either the two parts or the organoid and the cells mm -hmm. that are giving rise to novel properties, emergent properties of the system. Tamarins. Yeah, little primates, little, look at these guys. Look at them. Oh, nice. Sergio, these are actually real brain specimens of human, monkey, cat, turkey. And I'm wondering though, why wouldn't you just do the kind of research you're doing just with other animal brains? Why do you have to study the human brain? Most of what we know today about the brain actually comes from studies in animals, primarily rodents. Uh, and what we've learned a lot about, uh, you know, the mouse brain or the rodent brain, the characteristics that make the human brain unique are still to a large extent mysterious. And in fact, it is possible that the reasons why psychiatric disorders arise in humans has something to do with those unique characteristics. So, uh, you know, many of the animal models for disease have been quite useful, but there's 70 million years of evolution that separate us. Uh -huh. So it becomes more and more obvious that we also actually have to study human cells. And in fact, if we think about human genetics um, and the susceptibility to disease, it becomes even more important to think in that genetic context. So your latest work is, is taking this to another level where you've transplanted human brain organoids into rodents, into their brains, and uh, that gives a much more complex environment. Tell me, well, tell me why you did that, what, what, and, and what are you hoping to learn with that move? So there are at least two motivations for this latest platform that we've developed. Uh, one is that no matter how long we've kept the cells in a dish, mm -hmm. either as organoids or assembloids, there are features of neurons that are not recapitulated in the dish. So the cells are still not incredibly complex in their morphology. Mm -hmm. Their electrical properties are not very mature. Mm -hmm. And the other one had to do with, you know, what is the relevance of some of the defects that we can identify in a dish. I mean, if a cell has blunted dendrites, let's say, or blunted processes, does it mean that it will cause changes at the behavioral level or does you know the brain have a way of like compensating for that? Mm -hmm. And the reality is that we have no behavioral, no circuit relevant behavioral readouts for the cells that were, you know, we've developed in a dish. Mm -hmm. And so for those two reasons, trying to make more mature cells uh, and then try to obtain behavioral readouts, we decided you know, almost like seven years ago now to start this transplantation platform, which is just being published now, but this yeah. has been actually in the making for quite a, a long time. And the idea behind this transplant is that you would develop an organoid in a dish, but rather than let it develop in a dish, mm -hmm. um, you can take it and gently position it in the brain of a rat that is immunosuppressed so that the, the, you know, it doesn't reject the graft. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is actually we place them in the somatosensory cortex of the rat. Um, the part of the rat's cortex that receives sensory input from whiskers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, essentially place them and then we cl close uh, and we just wait. And it's interesting, we discovered very early on, almost by chance, that you can actually use MRI uh, to identify the graft. The graft has a different kind of like composition and appearance on an MRI, and that made a huge difference mm -hmm. because, we, we, because we could non-invasively monitor the transplant over long periods of time. And we discovered that the, you know, the transplant can grow very large, nine to 10, nine to 10 times mm -hmm. growth in volume over like three to four months. Um, and so in the end, it actually becomes a unit of human cortex that sits on one hemisphere and covers perhaps, 
you know, one third of a rat's hemisphere. Uh, and it goes all the way from the ventricle to the pia. Mm -hmm. it, again, it's important because it's reproducible in the same position. So it's in the somatosensory cortex of the rat. That made a huge difference because we could just go and later on probe mm -hmm. those human cells at specific time points. What did you learn from that experiment? How is that important for, for a medical uh, advance? So we've you know, started looking very carefully at how neurons developed in vitro versus in vivo. So, so in a dish versus exactly. In the body. So we, we took like you know uh, organoids derived from the same individual in the same differentiation experiments, and some of them we kept in a dish, mm -hmm. and others we have transplanted. And then we looked 250 days later to see how do they compare. And first of all, we just looked at cell composition and kind of like their properties, and discovered very interestingly actually that cell types are much better refined. So, you know, we, we know that cells in a dish, like in an organoid, will express markers of upper layers or deep layer cortical uh, neurons, but very often they're kind of like mixed together, so it's not that clear. Surprisingly, in vivo, this cluster are much better separated. And this is actually in line with recent work that shows that sensory input is quite important for the cells to fully mature um, and in fact, that seemed to be the case as well, because uh, we found that the thalamus, uh, which uh, brings, relays information from the whiskers to the cerebral cortex is directly connected to human cortical neurons. Uh, and then in fact, you can even go and move the whiskers of the rat uh, on the opposite side of the graft and trigger responses in human neurons that are following that stimulation, uh, showing that you, you can actually use sensory stimulation in a rat to trigger activity in human neurons. Isn't it amazing how nature has this built-in body plan that just runs on a program again and again? Look at the consistency here across these specimens. It is amazing. You couldn't have human beings make this on an assembly line and get that kind of consistency. That's just fascinating. And, and you see that also with the brain. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, in fact, that's something that we're trying to leverage in a dish as well. This very robust uh, programs, uh, developmental programs that build uh, organs. And it is remarkable, right? At the end of the day, we all have a quite similar brain. The brain has kind of like the same parts. Of course, it's different for each of us. But some of these forces that put together parts of the human brain, the cells yeah. um, are incredibly powerful. And once you provide the minimal conditions necessary, uh, they will take over and organize cells in a dish as well. That's remarkable. Will animals that have brain organoids from humans put into their brains ever develop human-like consciousness, human-like thinking? Well, I, I think probably not at this point. And there are a number of reasons for that, to believe that that is the case. The human graft still represents a small portion of the rat brain at this point. Um, so it's one third of a hemisphere, but in, you know, there may be two or three million cells, but the rat cortex with both hemisphere has maybe 31 million cells. So there's still a small fraction. There's still cells that are missing in the human graft. So for instance, we only put excitatory cells. We don't put inhibitory cells. Um, and perhaps the most important point is that timing of development is still conserved, meaning that you transplant the cells into a rat, but they still develop at their own pace. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you know, a week or so to make a rat cortex, but it takes 20 weeks or more to make a human cortex. So we may transplant them early in development and that facilitates the integration of human cells very early on, but there's very quickly a disconnect between the timing of the two species. And so, as you can imagine, you know, as the human cells kind of like wake up and start to connect, the rat brain is already wrapping up human brain development. They're starting to myelinate. And so they're limiting uh -huh. to some extent, uh, you know, how far human neurons will go and connect. And, and, and despite that, there's still quite some surprising levels of connectivity that we've discovered. But uh, there are some natural barriers, so to speak, just in the timing between the two species that at this point preclude, uh, you know, seamless 
integration. Of course, that would not be the case mm -hmm. for a transplantation in a primate, and I think. Yeah. Uh, well, what's fascinating is that I think people need to understand that you're interested in circuitry, and it's like the following analogy. Like if you took wires from a Ferrari, if you took brain cells from a human, and you put them into a radio, and you got the radio to work like a radio, it doesn't make the radio a Ferrari when you do that. It's still a radio. So this right. is still a rat. Right, it's still a rat. It's Absolutely. still a rat. And, and what's interesting about the behavioral test you did was the behavior that you're looking at was licking a water bottle. Oh, right? yes. So, I mean, so, so, I mean, so tell me more about like, like what it is that, what, 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 what that was all about. What, why the water bottle? Well, we had two type of ex behavioral experiments that we have done. One to test whether there is like input into the human graft. Mm -hmm. into the transplanted human neurons, and another one to see whether the human graft can actually participate to the rat circuit, mm -hmm. uh, integrate and perhaps participate to behavior. So, so it's not like, like the human brain organoid is, is giving human-like thoughts, it's just that it's participating in the way that it's like filling in that gap yeah. in the circuitry. Exactly. And it's still the rat behaving like a rat. Right. But the, the first behavior, which is like sensory input, mm -hmm. the sensory input comes from whiskers. We obviously <laughs> don't have whiskers, you know, kind of like to build on your analogy. Yeah. So in this case, human cells are just capable of receiving inputs and from whiskers and sending them along, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, obviously they're integrated in a circuit that we don't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the output, on the other hand, was to see whether, you know, the human cells could participate in a you know, very clearly defined behavioral tasks. So we uh, decided to focus on a reward task. So this is like rat behavior in a rat context. You're not seeing anything like human-like behavior. No, we, 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 we Not haven't. that we even understand what human-like behavior actually is, but it looks right. like the rats were behaving like normal rats. Right, yeah, and actually we've tested that extensively. I mean, one of our main concerns was the welfare of the animals. Mm -hmm. In fact, you would be more concerned about the rats not doing very well like right. their behavior deteriorating because of the transplant, then actually expect that they would like improve in some miraculous way. Mm -hmm. And we've tested them in various cognitive and uh, emotional tasks, and they were like not different than mm -hmm. other rats. They didn't, for instance, experience seizures, which was a main concern because we're putting a lot of excitatory cells mm -hmm. into the rat uh, cortex. But we wanted to see if, if manipulating human neurons could, for instance, change the behavior of a rat. So what we essentially did is we transplanted the human uh, organoid into the rat, mm -hmm. but the cells were carrying uh, this light sensitive protein that is sensitive to blue light only. So, so it's like the on and off switch. When exactly, the, the on light. and on switch. And so there's an optic fiber that goes to the rat uh, mm -hmm. skull and it's able to deliver uh, And this is not light. uncomfortable for the rat because it's just a little no. optic fiber. It's, it's a super, tiny optic fiber. Thin. They can move around. This type of experiments are done yeah, the in really neuroscience. The really interesting thing about what you just said is that actually your experiment succeeded in making them feel and behave like other normal rats. Because yeah. the, uh, the one risk was that they could have actually taken a nosedive. Oh, really absolutely. So poorly, but they didn't. They, they, absolutely. They, they were kind of like, you kind of rescued them back up to what typically they do. Right, yes. That's amazing. And, and so the rats can just like move around mm -hmm. and they receive water. And then we initially kind of like randomly stimulate uh, with either blue light or red light. Red light, of course, is not expected to trigger a behavioral change. And then we slowly kind of like teach the rats to associate blue light stimulation, so therefore mm -hmm. stimulation of human neurons with delivery of water. Mm -hmm. And so we do training for about a couple of weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, what you can actually do is you can just stimulate with blue light and rats will start seeking uh, water. So there's a water seeking behavior that can be triggered by mm -hmm. stimulating human neurons. We still yeah. don't know exactly how this happens. I mean, it, it could be that human neurons are somehow modulating reward centers in the rat, uh, but it could also just be that they're uh, like changing the, you know, the activity of surrounding rat cortical cells mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the somatosensory cortex. So we don't fully understand yet the mechanism. Uh, suffice it to say is that we have evidence now that by transplanting human neurons early in the developing rat in the somatosensory cortex, mm -hmm. you can actually change or manipulate aspects of the rat behavior. And that, of course, is very exciting because mm -hmm. uh, you can now do this with patient cells. Mm 
And so just imagine, and that's those are these experiments that we have done where you can transplant patient cells on one side, um, mm-hmm. uh, on one hemisphere, and then control cells onto the opposite side. Human, on both Human, sides. exactly. Mm-hmm. And then be able to compare side by side the properties of the cells. And we've actually used uh, we, we've used uh, we've used cells from patients with a specific form of autism and epilepsy, and mm-hmm. found that only by transplantation mm-hmm. can we actually identify defects. Like the cells, you would look at the cells in addition, you wouldn't find any differences, but then you put them in, and suddenly we see differences in how complex the cells mm-hmm. really are. And that process is actually, as we've shown a number of years ago, is activity dependent. Depends yeah. on the you know, amount of electrical signal that the cells receive. So um, this is to say that transplanting human cells uh, will may most likely reveal disease phenotypes that we would not be able to see yeah. in a dish. Yeah, so you're getting key information there about these diseases that have a genetic component, they start early in development. You get a, you get a chance to witness uh, the playbook of the disease, like how it actually unfolds in the brain exactly. as you compare it with healthy cells in the rat. You know, just to be clear then, you're not putting the brain organoids into the rat and then trying to observe human-like behavior. You want to see if will it continue to display rat-like behavior. So Absolutely. human beings don't have whiskers. No. And it's not like when you blow air on your whisker, a human being will want to lick a water bottle. Right. <laughs> that's not exactly. a typical human behavior. Right. I don't know what typical human behavior is, but that's not typical human okay. behavior. That's rat behavior. Right. So you want to, the readout, the behavioral readout you're getting is rat behavior, it's right. not human. Yeah, we want to essentially see if patient cells versus mm-hmm. you know cells derived from healthy controls would alter some of the you know behaviors of the rat in a way in some of this task so well, that we can chat. tell yeah. are they important mm-hmm. are some of the changes that we see in cells from patients are they relevant at the circuit at the behavioral level because you can find a lot of differences in a dish people have been describing yeah. numerous numerous changes but it's very difficult to tell are they important do they play a role in physiology in the pathophysiology of the disease mm-hmm. it was unexpected to me that that graph and your experiment would have worked in rats. Because many people would assume, oh, to get that kind of result, you have to put it into a non-human primate, and that is really, really controversial. Yeah. But, but you showed that you can actually do, answer all these scientific questions by using what in research is considered, considered to be kind of like a, the, 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 and the tier of animal complexity. You have yeah. rodents, and then you kind of get up to much more complex, much more controversial animals. You yeah. are able to show that you can answer these questions in a basic animal model right. in the rat. Obviously, people are very concerned, many people are very concerned about research that uses animals. And there's some who think that no animal research at all is ever justified. Other people have a different view where they might get less and less comfortable as you get more and more complex with your yeah. animal. So I think for those people, it's important to understand that so much of the work you're talking about can be done in rodent, and you don't have to go to something much more complex right. uh, that has much more complex emotions and experiences. Um, but this is research that you and I know is extremely tightly regulated. Right. Um, so Stanford, I'm sure, took an extremely close look at what you are proposing, and it was monitored very closely. Can you tell me a little bit about about that process? Yeah, and, and you know, just to build on your point, because. You know, certainly like one application of the work is just to try to get like cells more complex and capture mm-hmm. disease features. But there's another very important application of this platform and that is drug testing. Mm-hmm. Because as you can imagine, as we're identifying potential drug targets and drugs that could be used in these patients, there's a, a, a limited, uh, you know, there are a limited number of ways in which you can actually test them. Mm-hmm. Right? So there may be just simply animal models that don't recapitulate features of disease. Mm-hmm. And so how do you go from and like something- And you could something... use more animals than you need to- Of course. Be, because the models are terrible. Of course. You're burning through so many yeah. animals unnecessarily. Right. So if we can get much more efficient and right. targeted in the approach you're taking, you actually might use overall fewer animals. Of course. Yeah. Because you know the alternative to that is actually to use primate models, like oh, genetically yeah. modified primate models, which obviously come with a lot of ethical lot and of social like right. implications, and it's just a, a, a question of scale. There are hundreds of genes associated just with autism. Mm-hmm. I mean, can we build that many models? Is that ethically acceptable in the, primate, uh, in, right. in, the primate, in the primate? And so, as you can imagine here, 
if you have uh, rats that have a fraction of their cerebral cortex to be human, you can deliver some of these drugs in the rats and understand for instance, just for gene therapy or for mm -hmm. just drugs and see how are they affecting human cells in an in vivo context, which is like very important, especially for let's say gene therapy. So another very important application of the system beyond just like modeling disease mm -hmm. uh, is also try to reverse it by testing drugs in, a, in an in vivo environment where you have, um, you know, you, you inject them into the rat, but you hope to test it on human cells. Sergio, I brought you up to the sixth floor of the museum because I just love the view here. You can see the entire city of Boston and Cambridge. We have the water here. In fact, you can actually see the duck boats that leave the museum and get into the water. And the duck boats are so funny, right? Because they're, they're part boat and they're part bus. They drive on the city and then they get into the water. And it's what I would call a chimeric vehicle. Um, I know you and I don't really like the term chimera, but basically in biology, a chimera is an entity that has cells that come from other sources. So, for example, in medicine, as you know, someone who gets a heart transplant from a donor, technically they are a chimera. They are an individual that has an organ or cells that came from another individual. Thus, a human-human chimera. But I think what people are really concerned about are interspecies chimeras where the cells come from a different species, right? So in, in, in the kind of work you do, you put human cells, human brain organoids into a rat. And in that case, I guess, biologically speaking, that would be a chimera. You know, we don't really love that term, but it has a long history. The original chimera was a Greek monster from Greek mythology. And it was a fire-breathing monster that had a lion's head, it was a goat in the middle, and it had a serpent's tail. So it's actually a three-part chimera, not just a two-part. Um, and many people point to that origin of that word, and they say chimeras in the lab that you create by putting human cells into an animal. By the way, for things like cancer research, putting cancer cells into a laboratory animal and studying cancer cells. Um, anyway, these chimeras, they say, are, are freaks of nature, they shouldn't exist, you shouldn't make them in the lab. And they'll point to that chimera legend and say that original chimera was a freak of nature and it had to be destroyed. And I looked a little bit more into this chimera legend and I thought that, that can't be the simple lesson to learn from the chimera legend. <laughs> and so what I found was the chimera was actually defeated by a mortal human being. <laughs> this man was named Bellerophon. Bellerophon uh, fell asleep one day and Athena, the goddess of wisdom and philosophy, came down from Mount Olympus and she gave him a golden bridle, a bridle made out of gold, which when he woke up, he used to tame Pegasus, <laughs> the winged horse, which by the way, is also a chimera. That's true. <laughs> and so using ancient Greek technology of the day, the golden bridle, he tamed Pegasus and rode Pegasus and was able to defeat the chimera from up high. He was able to shoot darts or arrows at the chimera, avoiding her fire breath and killed her. And that was a great success story. Modern, or at that time, modern technology saved the day. And he went on though, the story goes on. It, does, it doesn't end with the death of the chimera. He goes on and defeats many, many other Greek enemies and becomes a huge hero and is celebrated until one day he decides he too is a god and should ride Pegasus up to Mount Olympus to take his side next to Zeus and all the other gods. So Pegasus realizes what's happening, and Pegasus objects and bucks Bellerophon off his back. Bellerophon falls down to earth, and he becomes crippled and blind for the rest of his life. So when I look at the Chimera legend from beginning to end, not just the, the introduction of the character of the Chimera, my lesson that I get from that is it's about hubris. Right? It's a lesson against using something to aggrandize yourself and to become bigger than who you actually are. So my lesson from the Chimera legend is not that mixed animals are bad and they have to be destroyed. Look at Pegasus. Pegasus was a widely admired, beautiful creature that went on to have many other adventures. It's not that the mixture is bad, it's how they're used. What they do for society. Is it bad for society or does it help society? Is it the chimera? Is it the pegasus? So um, context matters a great deal, right? But naming matters a lot as well because mm -hmm. by using certain names, we make assumptions 
using the term mini brain mm -hmm. may sound like a you know, yeah. a way of simplifying the science, but in fact, you're making an assumption that there's a tiny brain that has been miniaturized, which is not exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. Same thing, unfortunately, with Chimera, is that because they're charged with this myths, mm -hmm. uh, they already, you know, bring a series of assumptions yeah, yeah. into how the experiments are actually done. Somebody hears the word Chimera, they'll look it up in the dictionary exactly. online, and the first thing that pop up, pops up is right. this monster with a lion's right. head. And that's not what we do, nor is the purpose of the research that we do. Right. So many people, if they don't understand the details of, of an experiment or a scientific area, will backfill their exactly. lack of understanding with mythology. It's a very common human trait to backfill in things you don't understand with things that are easy to grasp, like mythologies, science fiction, and because you want to complete the story. Yeah, and you know, as you mentioned, terms do matter. And so for instance, one could also pick, instead of using the term chimera, you could say grafting, which yes. is also, uh, yeah. you know, an ancient, and uh, quite yeah. ancient. In horticulture. Uh, in horticulture, where you would graft parts of a tree onto another <laughs> right. with like purposes of, you know, getting new plants and better plants and so on and so forth. And in fact, one of the goals of the transplantation or the grafting mm -hmm. work that we and many others are doing is for therapeutic purposes. Right. You could also transplant cells into patients, for instance, in Parkinson's uh, disease patients, to actually restore some of the cells that have been, um, you know, have, have disappeared because of disease. You know, and, and I think what's challenging about the kind of work you're doing is it runs up against a very, very big tide of like mythological thinking and kind of like quick and easy conclusions and assumptions. People have all kinds of funny assumptions about even animals. Like people think the animals have a particular kind of nature. Snakes are sneaky, right? right. Foxes are cunning. Um, pigs are greedy, gluttonous. And so the idea is if you move from one species to another, you somehow, when you're transferring Transfer. cells, you're transferring that, um, that somehow like essential energy or that right. essential characteristic. I'm sure there are people who think, oh, if I get a pig heart transplant, you can make, people will make fun of me because I'll say, you know, you're, you're gonna suddenly change your behavior. I think that's also going on when you say you put human cells in the animal, then people right. assume, oh, well then, it's gonna take on something that's essential about humans, like our own consciousness and self-awareness. That leap, right, to say, because you transfer the cells, you're transferring over something about the essence of right. what that being is. So working in the kind of lab that you do, that is not an easy job because you, you and your lab folks have to be working 24 seven. The cells need care. The organoids need round the clock care. They don't take a day off. The animals that are part of your, your work, they need monitoring, they need care 24 seven. So it's so much work going into the lab on the weekends, evenings, people are always there monitoring everything. Do you ever, does it help to stop and think, who am I doing all this for? I have tenure at Stanford, like why, why am I working so hard? Like who do you, how do you get that inspiration to keep going no, my, on? As a physician, mm -hmm. By training, I wanted ultimately to find the treatment for some of these devastating conditions of mm -hmm. development. And in fact, I even still keep in contact with many of my patients, even back home in Romania that I've seen like many, many years wow. ago. When, uh -huh. you know, when I was starting, and it's, it's funny in a way, because when I started doing research in autism, and autism was still considered at that time to be a rare disease. It mm. was like unclear how common it actually is. Uh -huh. And now we do know that it's actually quite common. And so all I was able to do in Romania was actually measure in the blood of these patients various metabolites. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know the frustrating thing was, of course, that it was unclear, like, well, what does that tell us about the brain? It's like <laughs> so far away, like from uh -huh. the brain. And but in, in that journey, I got to meet many families. Uh, some of them who were just surprised at that time that anybody is interested in studying this disease. Interesting. Others who were like incredibly emotional about like somebody wanted to study this disease that uh -huh. also comes with a lot of stigma, especially at that time, came with a lot of stigma in mm -hmm. society. And so it's actually quite interesting. So I kept in contact with many of my patients and, and, and one in particular, Edward, who's now actually an accomplished like musician and composer, uh -huh. but who very early on tried to 
um, depicting drawings, like what he thought we were uh -huh. we were doing. And so initially he sent me this drawing where he was showing a, a human brain uh -huh. and then, um, you know, showing somebody walking up a stairs uh -huh. uh, to poke holes in people's brains and look at cells inside. Then he knew that they were like both like glial cells and neural cells and he thought we were looking at both. And of course I had to like have a conversation with him and explain one more time that that's not what we do. We don't poke holes in people's brains <laughs> to look at the cells and explain uh -huh. the process. And, you know, next day he essentially sent me another you know, drawing, which I think is actually a pretty accurate representation of the work that we do. Oh, great. And again, showing like taking skin cells from patients, uh -huh. turning back in time into stem cells. Um, and then he knew that we can turn them into any other cell types and then uh, show that we can make like neural cells from patients. And so that's actually quite uh, interesting uh, to see. And, you know, over the years, I had the chance of actually working very closely with a number or foundations for some of these rare uh, conditions where mm -hmm. parents are very actively involved in trying to encourage researchers to do some of the work. And so some of these families have actually visited the lab uh, quite often, met with the people in the lab, mm -hmm. uh, which is very often quite emotional. And I think it it, it puts the work that we do, as, as, as you said, in a broader context of, uh, you know, we have a mission here, we try to understand this, the biology of these devastating disorders and try to find the cure. And I think that's quite empowering for the team. Well, it's quite the journey you've been on from Romania to now Stanford. We're so glad that you're here doing the amazing work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.